This is part seven of President Donald J. Trump, beautifully reading, one of the best readers, I read really good, the fake, awful trash book, Fire and Fury by the Wolf Guy. Reading this basically just to prove that the book is trash, and yet I am arguably mankind's greatest reader. We've got, this is part seven, it's a part eight, okay? So you're at the second to last part, it's going to get really terrible, I'm sure, by now. But we're going to talk about what people think, the excerpts I've been handed. We're going to talk about what people think of me in the White House, which I'm guessing I know is unbelievably great. Morale is great. People respect me. But I'm sure this author is going to say terrible things. And then we're going to talk about my beloved two sons, Don Jr. and Eric. I know I have a third son somewhere, but they're the two that, you know, they do business, so I pay attention to them. So without further ado, as I eat my third fish fillet sandwich, this is very tiring. People think, I know I should be doing a lot of presidential stuff, but like, you'd be amazed how much free time I still have. And I'm eating McDonald's and I'm trying to reach the people by giving them, you know, they want to know that their president can read. And guess what? You're listening to it and I'm a beautiful reader. So let's hear what these people think of me according to this fake book. What did the people around Trump actually think of Trump? This was not just a reasonable question. It was the question those around Trump most asked themselves. They constantly struggled to figure out what they themselves actually thought and what they thought everybody else was truly thinking. Mostly, they kept their answers to themselves, but in the instance of Comey and Mueller, Beyond all the usual dodging and weaving rationalizations, there really wasn't anybody other than the president's family who didn't very pointedly blame Trump himself. This was the point at which the emperor's new clothes threshold was crossed. Now you could find out loud rather than freely doubt his judgment, acumen, and most of all the advice he was getting. He's not only crazy, declared Tom Barrack to a friend, he's stupid. Well, that's just not true. I'm very smart. I'm actually, as you probably well know, a, a genius and a very stable genius at that. But Bannon, along with Priebus, had strongly opposed the Comey firing while Ivanka and Jared had not only supported it but insisted on it. This seismic event prompted a new theme from Bannon, repeated by him widely, which was that every piece of advice from the couple was bad advice. Nobody now believed that firing Comey was a good idea. Even the president seemed sheepish. Well, I'm presidential. I'm not a sheep. I don't live on a farm. Once again, fake writing. Who, who, how am I a sheep? They're calling me sheepish. I'm actually presidential and very modern presidential at that. Hence, Bannon saw his new role as saving Trump, and Trump would always need saving. He might be a brilliant actor, but he could not manage his own career. And for Bannon, the new challenge brought a clear benefit. When Trump's fortune sank, Bannon's rose. Well, to be honest, I'm worth $10 billion. My fortunes never sink. They just continue to grow and grow. On the trip to the Middle East, Bannon went to work. He became focused on the figure of Lanny Davis, one of, Clinton impeach one of the Clinton impeachment lawyers. Let's not forget Clinton was impeached. Really bad guy. Who, for the better part of two years, became a near round-the-clock spokesperson and public defender of the Clinton White House. Bannon judged Comey... Mueller to be as threatening to the Trump White House as Monica Lewinsky and Ken Starr were to the Clinton White House, except I've never let Robert Mueller or James Comey blow me, even though they probably want to because I'm a very virile, handsome man. I would never let, so I don't even know why they're comparing it. Bannon, Sloppy Steve, bringing up Monica Lewinsky, it's a totally different thing. Um, and by the way, I don't understand analogies. Um, What the Clintons did was go to the mattresses with amazing discipline, he explained. They set up an outside shop, and then Bill and Hillary never mentioned it again. They ground through it. Starr had them in this construct. The president would occupy a parallel reality, removed from and uninvolved with what would become an obvious partisan blood sport, as it had in the Clinton model. Politics would be relegated to its nasty corner, and Trump would conduct himself as the president and as the commander-in-chief. So we're going to do it, insisted Bannon, with joie de guerre, joie de guerre, more French, fake writing, and manic energy. 
the way they did it. Separate war rooms, separate lawyers, separate spokespeople. I don't know why Bannon didn't tell me any of this. He apparently had all these ideas and didn't share them. I think he's, you know, he's either the writer's lying or Bannon's lying, you know, to make himself seem less sloppy. Separate war rooms, separate lawyers, separate spokespeople. It's keeping that fight over there so we can wage the other fight over here. Everybody gets this. Well, maybe not Trump so much. Not clear. Maybe a little. Not what he imagined. Bannon in great excitement and Priebus grateful for an excuse to leave the president's side. Well, guess what? If you were so grateful, I'm glad I fired you because now you can never be by my side. You're a loser from Wisconsin, you little rants. Where was I? Great focus. Unbelievable focus. Rushed back to the West Wing to begin to cordon it off. It did not escape Priebus's notice that Bannon had in mind to create a rear guard of defenders, David Bossy, Corey Lewandowski, and Jason Miller, all of whom would be outside spokespeople. That would largely be loyal to him. Most of all, it did not escape Priebus that Bannon was asking the president to play a role entirely out of character. The cool, steady, long-suffering chief executive. I am as cool as a cucumber, okay? A very steady. One of my greatest traits is how steady I am. Okay, believe me. So once again, Bannon and Priebus, two losers. Okay, ratty Rance, Priebus, and sloppy Steve. And it certainly didn't help that they were unable to hire a law firm with a top-notch white-collar government practice. By the time Bannon and Priebus were back in Washington, three blue-chip firms had said no. All of them were afraid they would face a rebellion among the younger staff if they represented Trump. Afraid Trump would publicly humiliate them if the going got tough, and afraid Trump would stiff them for the bill. Well, I always pay my debts. That's, you know, that's fake news that I'm cheap. In the end, nine top firms turned them down. Well, then they're not very top firms, are they? That's, that's a lie because a top firm wouldn't turn me down, so they're obviously fake top firms. So now, in the last portion of part, what are we on? Part seven, my goodness. We are now up to my two beautiful business age sons, Don Jr. and Eric. So let's see what the fake book Fire and Fury has to say about these great, great kids and their great kids. And remember, they're only kids, so they're not felons and they can't be charged with things because they're children. <clears throat> and by the way, get me uh, some chicken McNuggets. I haven't had those in a while. Thank you. Donald Trump's sons, Don Jr., 39, and Eric, 33, existed in an enforced infantile relationship to their father, a role that embarrassed them, but one that they also professionally embraced. The role was to be Donald Trump's heirs and attendees. Their father took some regular pleasure in pointing out that they were in the back of the room when God handed out brains. But then again, Trump tended to scorn anyone who might be smarter than he was. Their sister Ivanka, certainly no native genius, was the designated family smart person. Well, that's not true. I am. I'm the smart person. I'm the smartest. Her husband, Jared, the family's smooth operator. That left Don and Eric to errands and admin. In fact, the brothers had grown into reasonably competent family-owned company executives. That is not saying all that much because their father had little or no patience for actually running the company. Of course, quite a good amount of their professional time was spent on the whims, projects, promotions, and general way of life of DJT. Hey, that's me, right? I'm DJT. Lewandowski regarded both brothers and their brother-in-law with rolling on the floor contempt. Not only were Don Jr. and Eric stupid, and Jared somehow both supercilious and obsequious, no idea what those mean, the butler, but nobody knew a whiff about politics. Indeed, there wasn't an hour of political experience among them. As time went on, Lewandowski became particularly close to the candidate. To the family, especially to Kushner, Lewandowski was an enabler. Trump's worst instincts flowed through Lewandowski. I knew I missed Corey for some reason. Even though I couldn't have him around, he reminded me that he banged Hope Hicks, and that's, you know, that's going to be wife number four for me, so I can't really have him around, to be perfectly honest. Where am I? Great focus, by the way. In early June, a little more than a month before the Republican National Convention, Jared and Ivanka decided that what was needed for the sake of the campaign, for the sake of the Trump business, was an intervention. 
making common cause with Don Jr. and Eric, Jared and Ivanka pushed for a united front to convince Trump to oust Lewandowski. Don Jr. feeling squeezed not only by Lewandowski, but by Jared too. And Jared's very weak, so the fact that he felt squeezed by him, that's pathetic. He really is. A, Don Jr. really is a, a really, it's sad, as I would say on Twitter. Very sad. Seize the opportunity. He would push out Lewandowski and become his replacement. And indeed, 11 days later, Lewandowski would be gone. All this was part of the background to one of the most preposterous meetings in modern politics. On June 9, 2016, Don Jr., Jared, and Paul Manafort met with a movie-worthy cast of dubious characters in Trump Tower after having been promised damaging information about Hillary Clinton. Don Jr., encouraged by Jared and Ivanka, was trying to impress his father, and he'll never do that, he's a loser. Where was I? Great focus. We are, uh, you know, they make the writing is so small, it's unbelievable. You're trying to read this, this trash book. And where are we? Trying to, he was trying to impress me, but he can't because he's a loser. Here we go. That he had the stuff to rise in the campaign. When this meeting became public 13 months later, it would, for the Trump House, Trump White House, encapsulate both the case against collusion with the Russians and the case for it. It was a case, or the lack of one, not of masterminds and subterfuge, but of senseless and benighted people so guileless and unconcerned that they enthusiastically colluded in plain sight. No collusion. This is fake news. Whatever the reason for the meeting, no matter which of the above scenarios, most accurately describes how this comical and alarming group came together. A year later, practically nobody doubted that Don Jr. would have wanted his father to know that he seized the initiative. Well, of course he did. He told me right away. What's that? I'm getting a call from my lawyer. He said not to say. It never happened. Don Jr. never told me. Okay, the real story is Don Jr. never told me. The chance that Don Jr. did not walk these Jumos, Jumos, some kind of Bannon word, up to his father's office on the 26th floor is zero, said an astonished and derisive Bannon, not long after the meeting was revealed. The three senior guys in the campaign, an incredulous Bannon went on, thought it was a good idea to meet with a foreign government inside Trump Tower in the conference room on the 25th floor with no lawyers. They didn't have any lawyers. Even if you thought that this was not treasonous or unpatriotic or bad shit, and I happen to think it's all of that, you should have called the FBI immediately, even if you didn't think to do that, and you're totally amoral and you wanted that information, you do it in a Holiday Inn in Manchester, New Hampshire, with your lawyers who meet with these people and go through everything, and then they verbally come and tell another lawyer in a cutout. Wow, Bannon, by the way, very good at espionage and cheating the system. He's really laying it out pretty well there. We should have, maybe we should have listened to him, but there was no collusion, by the way. No collusion, fake news. Fake book, by the way, really fake book. But I'm learning a lot about all these people that were supposedly, you know, working for me. Steve Bannon, Sloppy Steve, really doing a lot of talking here. Really kind of upset. If I, if I had self-reflection, I might be kind of upset and questioning why I got so close to him. And if you've got something, then you figure out how to dump it down to Breitbart or something like that, or maybe some other more legitimate publication. You never see it, you never know it, because you don't need to. But that's the brain trust that they had. Likewise, the Trump family, no matter its legal exposure, was not going to be run by its lawyers. Jared and Ivanka helped to coordinate a set of lurid leaks, drinking, bad behavior, personal life in disarray, about Mark Kazowitz. Hey, that's, that's my former lawyer, very good guy. Why would they do that? Not that I don't know, of course, I know everything that goes on in my campaign, but I'm not sure I knew this. And uh, believe me, I, I liked Mark, he was pretty good. Who would advise the president to send the couple home? Shortly after the presidential party returned to Washington, Kazowitz was out. So that concludes part seven of this beautiful reading of this trash book by President Donald J. Trump. Come back for part eight, the final part. I'm sure it's full of real, real disgusting trash.